better than than many Christians that if you can cause doubt about the first chapter of Genesis through the age of the universe, the age of the earth, then you don't have to mess with the rest of the book. They get it better than too, you know, too many Christians. So a lot of what I'm going to show you here deals with things that just simply can't be if it was so old or evidence showing that it can't be so old. It's got to be a young universe or a young solar system. So those are the kinds of things we're going to be talking about here. And you see here, astronomers do have a sense of humor as they use the black marker on the eyepiece there. All right. Okay, we saw this verse in, in the first service there. And we are so blessed to be able to see these things from these powerful telescopes that are not able to be seen in previous generations. So what about the moon? Well, we actually don't know as much about the moon as we should, even though it's so close to us. There's so many things. And uh, here, this is a quote, you know, from my favorite uh, institution uh, of learning, the University of Arizona, in addition to the one I teach at, Arizona Christian University. And so the large moon, the size of the moon, reflects significant light at night. In other words, it's doing its job that it was made to be the lesser light of the night, to reflect the sunlight. And it does indeed have the perfect service, phys surface for this. Physicists have said it's the ideal surface for reflecting light. It does contain a significant amount of water. Did any of you know that the moon actually has water? One, two, three, four of you. Five. Six. It's amazing. Seven. I, until three years ago, I didn't know this myself. I had no clue that there was moon water. And so it says, the multiplying mysteries of moon water. And I'll magnify it. It says, that's because we thought until recently that the moon was just about the driest place in the solar system. And here's a terrible pun. Then reports of moon water started pouring in. <laughs> starting with estimates of scant amounts on the lunar surface, then gallons in a single crater, and now 660 million tons of water. That's a huge amount of water. Distributed among 40 craters near the lunar North Pole. So we thought we understood the moon, but we don't. It's clear now that water exists up there in a variety of concentrations and geologic settings. And who'd have thought we'd be pondering the moon's hydrosphere? Well, isn't this interesting in light of what I showed you in the, in the first service, that in the f first day of creation, it says everything is made out of water. And so why would there not be water on the moon? So here is a photograph showing the map of the North Pole with these craters. And you can see the densities of white there with uh, water, ice, in those craters. And so here is how everything started out in this giant ball of water here in the first day of creation. And the moon also stabilizes the rotational axis of the earth. In relationship to the size of the moon to the size of the earth, the ratio of the size of the moon to the earth, our moon is, has a larger ratio of size than the moons of the other planets because those other planets are so huge. So you see Jupiter there with four of its largest moons. Now they're bigger than our moon, but in terms of the ratio of their size to their planet, that ratio is much, much smaller. Well, this is important because that large relative size of the moon is what stabilizes the wobble of the Earth because the Earth's wobble actually goes between 22 and a half and 24 and a half degrees with an average of 23 and a half degrees. So the significant size of the moon in relationship to the Earth with its gravity is what minimizes that wobble and keeps it stable. Well, this is important because it minimizes seasonal variations. And here again, we have in Scripture talking about signs and seasons with the bodies in the firmament, in the heavens. And so here, it's showing the amount of tilt that we have currently uh, averaging 23 and a half degrees. But if this tilt were to be greater, then the differences between the wet and dry seasons would become much more intense and temperatures would become much more significant that if the Earth then would be having its rotation so that it's basically rolling along, one half would get baked and the other half gets frozen. Well, that's what the case is with Mercury. 
planet Mercury is half gets baked and half gets frozen because it doesn't spin. And uh, Pluto and Uranus are actually rolling along because their axis is painting, pointing toward the sun. So this would make life very uh, untenable on Earth if that were the case. The gravity of the moon also is very important for the pull on the oceans to stir up the coastal waters to agitate them and reoxygenate the water so that the life in the ocean has adequate oxygenation to be able to survive and thrive. And the earth uh, moon distance is increasing. The moon is moving away from the earth gradually about an inch and a half or so a year. It's a very small amount for only 6,000 years, that would not be a significant distance. But over evolutionary time frame, this would be a giant problem, well, is a giant problem. Uh, so how this happens is the pull of the moon's gravity upon the water of the oceans causes a bulge, the tides, to come up and down, you know. Uh, maybe you've seen films of the Bay of Fundy in Canada where the, it's the most extreme tides on the planet where it's huge amount, uh, like 50 feet or more, uh, a horrendous amount of tidal ups and downs. Well, so with this bulge, what happens is that water is attracted towards the moon that slows the earth down a very tiny amount, which then causes the moon to speed up and move outward. And so over the evolutionary time frame, if you multiply an inch and a half times the zillions of years, about 1.5 billion years actually, this is what you would see. The moon would be that big because it would be so close and eventually it would be actually touching the earth. Well, the reason they show all this volcanic activity is because if the moon were that close, the intense gravity would fracture the earth's crust and cause all this magma to come up out of the crust and have all this, and of course, life would not be compatible with that. So there is this problem here of how the moon actually came into being for the evolutionists uh, because of this business of them insisting on 4.7 billion years and knowing that the moon is receding at an inch a half a year. So how did the moon come about? Is they have different theories. One of their bigger theories is that a third body came careening into the earth, crashing into it, causing a big chunk of the earth to split off and become the moon. I guess, you know, kind of like playing billiards uh, type thing. But if that happened, then how did the moon and the earth both end up being so round? Instead of having some weird odd shape, like the moons of Mars having weird shapes. Phobos and Deimos. So um, here are quotes from evolutionists. Uh, a new analysis of isotopes, in other words, the variations of the atoms that have different numbers of neutrons in them, shows that the lunar uh, minerals uh, are not the same as the ones on Earth. So the rocks that we brought back, or the Apollo astronauts brought back from Earth, show a different composition, I mean from the moon, show a different composition than the ones here on Earth. They show that the moon did not come from the Earth. Real science, real evidence, real experiments, no presuppositions. So then this next quote, if the giant impact hypothesis doesn't explain the moon, how did it get there? Well, there's lots of things they don't have answers to. We do. We have the answer day four. So in the proper position, it causes solar eclipses. And I mentioned this in the first service briefly, but first we have to look at the zork in the earth. All right, you all have heard of the man in the moon. So you notice that the Zork is shaped like North and South America. See? So that's why it's the Zork in the Earth. All right. Well, let's take a look at the sun. Well, how do stars form since our sun is a star? Well, we're told. This is given in very declarative language as if this were known established fact published just this summer. 
They're born from clouds of gas and dust. As the mass builds, the material then collapses, forming a central core, then it accumulates more gas and dust, and it finally ignites, okay? Well, that's a fairy tale. Here's a, a wiser quote here. It might seem that star formation is a problem that has been solved, but nothing could be further from the truth. The birth of stars remains one of the most vibrant topics in astrophysics today. So when they call something a vibrant topic, that's a way of saying, we don't know. <laughs> For example, where do the gaseous clouds that allegedly form stars come from and what makes them collapse? Whatever the cause, theory suggests that once the collapse begins, fragmentation to smaller and smaller clumps naturally follows instead of forming a bigger clump that becomes a star. In fact, the interstellar medium, in other words, the stuff in space out there between objects, is a lot more complicated, and heat isn't the only factor opposing gravitational contraction. Two other important factors are rotation and magnetism. So they say, guys, it's more complicated. Okay, most people may have heard of Stephen Hawking, brilliant physicist, who is now, after being a lifelong denier of God, he's now a creationist. Why? Because he left the planet. All right? We are just an advanced breed of monkeys on a minor planet of a very average star. Okay, well, he may have thought he was a breed of monkey, but I certainly don't think of myself that way. Very average star. Okay, that's what he says. Very average star. Well, not true. Because the sun our star, is anything but ordinary. It is very unordinary. And it falls into this category of stars that only are 4% of all the stars. So it's extremely unordinary in many ways. Not only being in that category of stars based on its physical properties like size and temperature, those types of things, it's also very stable. The solar flare here is minimal compared to the solar flares of other stars that are so large that they would um, be like a blowtorch and, and cook our planet at the distance of 93 million miles. And so I have a little square here just to highlight the Earth in comparison to the size of this flare, but the Earth is so far away this flare is not a problem, except occasionally they may disrupt communications. But what makes our, one of the things that makes our sun so remarkable is that it is designed for photosynthesis. In other words, the kind of radiation it puts out. So it puts out everything from gamma rays, which are lethal, to X-rays, which are also lethal, because they're so high energy, short wave, high energy waves. Then we get to this extremely narrow band, which has been expanded, so you can appreciate it, of visible light, what we see, flanked by ultraviolet light on one side and infrared on the other, and then radio waves. And so these are incredibly slow uh, waves, low energy, long wavelength waves. And even gets even longer to the fact where, where you get to, if you've ever felt an earthquake, that is an extremely long length wave. But looking at this uh, uh, visible light here, you can see that the amount of energy is three units compared to 60,000 units in a photon from an X-ray tube. So that's why we use lead shields so that only the part that needs to be seen is radiated to minimize our exposure to this type of energy which can cause damage. So this special light, sunlight, is very critical for life on this planet. And the amazing th one of the amazing things is that 42% of the output of our sun is the right kind of light for photosynthesis. That's an amazing statistic. 42% the right kind of light for photosynthesis it has the right wavelength to be able to stimulate these particular kinds of molecules that are called photosynthetic pigments 
because it involves color. The wavelengths at which they absorb the light are the wavelengths of various colors that we see. So we all know that the word chlorophyll is what is used for the stuff that makes leaves green, and that is the major photosynthetic pigment. And the word chlorophyll literally means chloro green fill leaf, green leaf. That's what the word means. So when the chlorophyll in the fall, and up here at this elevation, you have a bit more in deciduous trees than we do down in the desert. Uh, this is what you get to enjoy, it's probably up especially in the canyons in the Huachuca Mountains, right? So this is the demonstration of those other photosynthetic pigments that are masked by the chlorophyll. And once the chlorophyll um, is uh, decaying in the leaves, these other pigments become visible. They're there all along, but then they become visible. And what a beautiful display that you get to enjoy. So all these pigments together absorb the light so that photosynthesis can take place. And in that bottom left part there, you see a, the representation of the uh, molecule um, that absorbs, the, the chlorophyll molecule that absorbs the light, converting it into stored chemical energy. So it's converting radiant energy from the sun into stored chemical energy in the form of sugar. That's what photosynthesis is all about. So there is showing you that molecule, chlorophyll. It has a complex structure and there's a magnesium atom, ion, in the middle. And guess what it looks an amazingly similar to? Hemoglobin in your bodies, in your red blood cells with iron instead of magnesium. Same basic structure. The major difference is that long tail of carbon and hydrogen on the chlorophyll. Well, that's so that that molecule can be anchored in the, in the membrane of the cell so it stays where it's supposed to be. So do you think this is design or random chance? Yeah. <laughs> Evolutionists yearn for life elsewhere, but there's always a monkey in the wrench such as nearby stars having a tendency to lash out at their planets with deadly flares of ultraviolet and X-ray radiation. So those other stars don't have the stability of ours with the high percentage of light being appropriate for photosynthesis. Well, another thing that makes uh, our sun special is this business of angular momentum. Well, first, let's talk about what regular linear momentum is, and that's the tendency of an object that's moving along in a straight line to keep moving along in a straight line. You know, mass times uh, velocity is momentum. So you have angular momentum, which is then the tendency for an object going around in a circle to keep going around in a circle. And so as we see these ice skaters and they have their extremities extended out, they move spin slowly. But when they pull the extremities in and tighten up, they spin so much more quickly. So the total amount of angular momentum is the same. But because of the mass being concentrated in the center, the speed is much, much faster. So apply the same concept to our solar system. And the sun has 99 plus percent of the mass of the solar system, so it should have 99 plus percent of the angu uh, angular momentum of the solar system. Because you can see how massive it is compared to the sum total of the other planets. That's not to scale, that's just to show the order of the planets and relative sizes. But the distances are not to scale. Well, so if there was the conservation of angular momentum uh, according to the mass distribution in the solar system, the sun should have 99 plus percent of its angular momentum of the solar system, but it, guess what, it only has 2%. So this angular momentum would have caused the sun to spin very rapidly, but it spins very slowly, and the planets very quickly. Sun has 99% plus mass, only 2% of the angular momentum. This would not have happened if the whole solar system was made from a cloud of gas, gas and dust that condensed to form the sun and the planets. This would not have happened. See, simple things that you can remember, simple things. It's not complicated stuff. So, 
the angular, the ultimate origin of the solar system, angular momentum, remains obscure. That's another way of saying we don't know. Okay, here's another issue. According to evolutionary theory, the sun should have been much less bright, putting out much less radiation, much less heat in its younger billions of years. So that yellow line you see increasing up to what it says 100% at the corner on the top right is today's level of output of the sun, which would be essentially the same as 6,000 years ago. But in the evolutionary time frame, they say there would be this huge difference according to their theory of how stars come into being. Well, if you look at the very bottom, it says three and a half billion years ago, life begins in their way of assuming things. Well, except the problem is the planet would be frozen. So how do you have life beginning in the frozen planet when the sun is not so bright? That's why they call this the faint young sun paradox. So they recognize the problem, but they don't have a solution for it. Well, instead of it takes two to tango, it takes three to tango. And here we are with the sun, the moon, and the earth. So you see the relationship that's necessary for a total solar eclipse to occur. And umbra means shadow, as in an umbrella. The umbrella is to make a shadow so you're not baked by the sun. Okay, penumbra means the area next to the shadow where it's partial shadow instead of complete. So when the moon is in proper position, you get a complete shadow, a complete solar eclipse, such as in this picture here. Well, for this to happen, there has to be the exact appropriate lineup of the moon being just in the right position in terms of up and down between the earth and the sun to be able to have this happen. Not only that, it has to be exactly the right size. So we have here in Amos, he turns the shadow of death into morning and makes the day dark as night. He's talking about an eclipse, a total eclipse. Well, here is sunlight looking at the sun directly through a solar telescope as we have up on Kitt Peak, uh, the McMathis telescope. And then here you see with just the sunlight coming directly from the sun, not the light coming from what's called the corona, the crown around the sun. So here's the light coming just from the sun. So this is the photosphere, the light sphere. And then with a total eclipse, now all that is seen is the corona, the crown, called the chromosphere, the color sphere. And that's why it's critical for the moon to be the same apparent size as the sun. Well, this happens because even though the sun is 400 times, the diameter of the sun is 400 times greater than the diameter of the moon, the sun is also 400 times farther away from the earth and the moon. So that's how they have the same apparent size and the perfect size needed for a total solar eclipse to occur. So do you think this was a random chance event? No, this was design. God designed the universe so that we could explore it and learn from it for his glory. So here we see how a prism refracts white light. White has all of the colors in it. And so the prism breaks it up so you see we get the rainbow. That's how we get rainbows is the raindrops in the sky so when you have rain in one part of the sky and you have the sun shining in another part of the sky, that's how we get a rainbow because those raindrops act as prisms and break up the light into this pattern. And remember, that's God's promise in chapter 9 of Genesis not to repeat the worldwide flood to destroy the earth. So with this light being broken up into a prism, um, we can then see the fingerprints inside the light telling us which elements are in the star that's light, whose light is being investigated. 
So there you see the representation of the sun, photo of the sun next to that upper band, the colored band, and that's called an absorption spectrum because the light is visible except where the dark bands are. So that's the dark bands are where the light is being absorbed because it's black. At the bottom one, you see here where this eclipse is occurring, it's called an emission spectrum because we're seeing those fingerprint lines as color and the background as black. So we could only see these emission spectra only because of a total eclipse. Otherwise, we would never see, have seen these. Well, back in 1868, there was a total solar eclipse and in anticipation of that, uh, enterprising scientists made this device here so that the light would go in, be reflected off the mirror, be broken up by the prism, that rectangle on the left-hand side, be reflected off the mirror again, and then come out like that, refracted by that prism. And so that was how, for the first time, they were able to see this in 1868. So that's the fingerprint of hydrogen in the starlight, in the sunlight. Well, because of this experiment at that time, they also were able to pick out this fingerprint, which had never been seen before, and they were able to figure out that this was helium. And this is why it was named helium, because it was first discovered in the sun, helios being the Greek word for sun. It was not known to be on Earth until afterwards. Then they said, oh, we better look for it on Earth, since we know now it's in the sun. Well, due to that, knowledge gained, we're now able to analyze starlight with these spectra and figure out all sorts of properties. So you see there line G, that represents the class of stars that our sun is in. So we can classify these stars according to the things in the light that show us how fast they're rotating, what their magnetic field strength is, what their temperature is, uh, if they're moving away or toward us. All those kinds of things can be figured out by looking at the light. And so now we've learned that most stars have about three quarters hydrogen, a quarter helium, a trace of lithium, and then varying amounts of the other elements. That's how each star is unique, because none of them are exactly the same in how much they have of which components. And they, not, they have different temperatures, and they have the different speeds that they're moving, and they have the different rotation rates and the different strengths of the magnetic field. So that's what's given to us in Psalms here, 147, where he counts the number of the stars, calls them all by name, because they're each individually different. They're each unique. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. The music was so fantastic, appropriate for this, this morning. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Thank you. Alrighty, well here is another issue, and I touched upon this in the first service and will in the second service, this business of the stretching of the universe, not expansion, but stretching, which is limited. And it's been learned and experimentally confirmed of Einstein's theory that indeed gravity does affect time, and gravity also bends the fabric of space. So we have that the heavens have been stretched as we have some 17 verses about the stretching of the heavens like a tent or a curtain. So I mention here that gravity actually bends the fabric of space. It bends light. Gravity will cause the light to change direction. So here you see the clocks showing that away from gravity, the clock runs faster than the clock where the gravity is strong, and that gravity will bend light as it goes past something with lots of gravity. So here at night, looking through a telescope, you see where these stars, number one and two, appear to be located. So now it's daytime, and we're seeing the moon getting ready to move between the sun and the earth. And so it does. And now here's the total eclipse. 
And so now being able to observe those same stars, their actual position is now determinable during that total solar eclipse. And though, so this shows that Einstein indeed had it right, that gravity bends light as it passes by something with lots of gravity. I, I still can't fully grasp how smart Einstein was. <laughs> it's, it's beyond me. So incredibly intelligent. Well, eclipses are beautiful, and so they've led to being able to stand all this stuff that we can learn from light, discovery of helium, confirmation of Einstein's theories of relativity, observing these solar prominences, and so here you're going to see one that's rather large for our sun, and uh, showing not how close the Earth is, but just its approximate size in comparison. So if this thing were to flash out, lash out, like other stars do, we would be beyond toast. We would be charcoal. So the stability of our sun there is very important. So here the character is asking, Grim, does moonlight become me? Not as much as a total eclipse. <laughs> All right, planets and moons. Okay, this business of planetary formation, it's supposed to be either compression, collision, or coalescence. So with compression, this business of dust and gas being pulled together by gravity, forming these uh, disks, which then uh, concentrate into planets, moons, and stars. That's what's supposed to happen. But the problem with this is a thing called Oh yeah, here's the picture of a supposed ring like this. The problem with this is Boyle's Law of Gases. So as you compress a gas, it'll heat up, and the heat causes it to expand back out. So if you try to compress this gas cloud out in space, guess what? It's going to heat up, expand back out, and you're not going to get a star or a solar system. It's very simple. Compressed gases heat up. So a gas that's decompressing cools down, right? So if you've ever let air out of a car tire, it's cold. You know, notice that? It's cold because it's decompressing and it uh, doesn't have the heat in it that the compressed gas will have. Or how about by collision? Well, like watch what I'm going to do here with a billiard ball. See, well, that's what's going to happen, right? We'll do it again. These things are not going to stick together. And by coalescing, they're just saying that things are just going to gradually come together. It's not necessarily gravity, they're just going to come together. And this is their imagination of how that happens. But in reality, uh, reality is being acknowledged here. Constructing planets is a delicate business. Trying to get tiny bits of dust to join up into spheres has never been found to work. It has to work fast, though, because unless the whole planet clears its dust lane, the stuff will end up in the star. Seems you can't get there from bottom up, and even if you could, you'd be in trouble. These and other problems with planet building were discussed. In other words, it doesn't work. So here is something that's being observed by the European Southern Observatory uh, in Chile, the very large telescope, and they're assuming this is the formation of a young star. Well, it's assumption. They don't know. Earth is utterly unique. Everything about it is just right. Our solar system is a freak, not the most typical kind of system that nature cooks up. Even the planet's rotation has to be just right. Life can't exist on a planet that rotates too fast or slow. It should be slowly. This is yet another Goldilocks problem for astrobiologists. Well, the term astrobiologist to me is kind of funny. That means they're assuming life is out there in the stars. Uh, well, they're looking for it, but I don't think they're going to find it. There's this thing called a habitable zone. So you see this green band that I inserted there to show that Earth has to be in this Goldilocks thing where things are just right. And it, it has to be um, regarding gravity, regarding temperature, speed of rotation, all sorts of things. 
And so we've got our astronauts out there, and he says, listen, I think we better keep this quiet. Okay, Earth is on a string there like a balloon. So we have rotation here, with showing, showing how Earth and seven of the other planets rotate. But look at Venus, it's the opposite direction. And look at Uranus, it's also in the opposite direction, and Uranus is tilted on its side. So it's more rolling around than spinning and moving in its orbit that way. So if the whole solar system were made from this one cloud of gas, condensing, everything ought to be rotating the same direction. See how simple that is. Well, Pluto is really goofy. Uh, it's not even in the same plane of the, as the rest of the planets, and it's also kind of rolling along as well. And its moon, uh, Chiron, is way out of the plane of the solar system. And finally, thanks to the latest probe of a couple of years ago, we finally have actual clear pictures of Pluto now. Uh, and there's this big heart shaped, like I Love Lucy heart there, the, the wider area. Um, uh, a plane, they call it, uh, which is a mystery to the geologists uh, how this came about. You know, if everything were made from the same cloud, all the planets should look the same. They should have the same composition. But yet we have these gas giants and these frozen ice balls, and then we have these three inner rocky planets. Tremendous diversity in the makeup of the planets here. And another thing is, they are putting out more heat than they're getting from the sun. They're actually radiating heat. They're putting out more than they're getting from the sun. If they were truly 4.7 billion years old, this wouldn't be happening. They would have already cooled off. They have to be young to still be radiating the heat. And now that we have even more finely detailed pictures of the rings of Saturn, because we're seeing there are more than what was thought was there before, and even smaller and finer rings, in addition to the larger ones, they're saying that this means that the rings have to be much, much younger than previously thought, because if they were older, the components of these rings would be colliding with each other and disrupting them. The architecture wouldn't be so fine and perfect. So it says young. Now, they're saying young meaning 100 million years instead of uh, 4.7 billion years. Well, there's a big difference between 100 million and 5.7 billion. So it's not yet down to the biblical time frame, but at least they're headed in the right direction. And in addition to the problem of the planets rotating in different directions, eight of the larger moons also rotate backwards. And these three planets, Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune, have moons in both directions going around like this. Okay? In the same planet. Amazing. Here is something. What, what do you think this blue spot represents if I tell you it's actually part of the moon Io? It's part of the moon. It's not something coming from around the backside. What would this be? Real question. Okay, gases from a flare from how about a volcano? Active volcanic activity on Io. That means there's a lot of heat in that planet, uh, that moon. This cannot be billions of years old. It has to be young. Okay, Titan, the large, large moon of Saturn here, is moving away from Saturn 100 times faster than thought, which means it has to be much younger or it already would have been out of there if it were billions of years around. So this is an even bigger problem than the business of the receding of the moon from the Earth. The system cannot be that old. It has to be much younger. Okay, Iapetus has a bad case of acne here. All right, this intense, intense cratering. And so these secular scientists uh, admit that at the current rate, so there's the rates of cratering that we observe, show that if it was only the slow rate of cratering we observe today, that then this would be a thousand billion years 
for Iapetus to have that appearance. So this implies that there must have been a much higher catastrophic rate of cratering in the past, which would explain how our moon could only be thousands of years old. Isn't that an amazing statement? Happily from the University of Arizona. All right. Miranda, look at this weird architecture here, the geology. How do you explain this? So different than everything else. Such unique appearance. You might also think that these disparate bodies are scattered across the solar system without rhyme or reason. But move any piece of the solar system today or try to add anything more and the whole construction would be thrown fatally out of kilter. So how exactly did this delicate architecture come to be? Ooh, if you have delicate architecture, what do you have to have? A, an architect, yeah, a designer, an architect, absolutely. Hmm. The discovery of thousands of star systems wildly different from our own has demolished ideas about how planets form. Astronomers are searching for a whole new theory. Perhaps the biggest question is why is our solar system so different? The more new planets we find, the less we seem to know about how planetary systems are born. Born, he says, according to a leading planet hunter. So here is ours, with Pluto being out of the main plane of the solar system. And here is the Upsilon Andromeda, a planetary system. Very different architecture. How about the Are Gamma Cephei AB system? With another star, that red dot being a second star, which is going around the main star and the planet. Weird, very different. Comets and asteroids. So here we have showing where the asteroid belts are, the main one, which is between Mars and Jupiter, and then what's called the Trojan belt of asteroids in the same orbit as Jupiter, the two parts of it on each side of Jupiter. Well, here's the largest, one of the largest ones, Vesta. So this has been promoted to minor planet status while Pluto was demoted to minor planet status. So now they say there are eight planets in our solar system and several minor planets. One of them in the asteroid belt, Pluto, and then another one further out than Pluto. Well, with these asteroid belts, uh, there's a problem because all these things are bouncing around in those belts. And here's a still from Star Wars right and they're going through the asteroid belt and what's happening as they fly through all these bodies are coll uh, colliding with each other and of course hopefully they want to get through without being hit so it says here collisions between asteroids are continuously grinding the bodies down why do asteroids still exist after grinding each other down all this supposed time if the main belt were that old, it would contain nothing more than dust, remnants of the active bodies that once orbited there. These are secular guys publishing in secular journals, acknowledging reality. Comets. So these comets have uh, come through in just the last few decades. Uh, Halley's Comet, Ikea Seki, Hale-Bopp, Enki, and the most dramatic one, Shoemaker-Levy. Now here you see it in multiple fragments. It wasn't this way when it was approaching, it was in one piece, but the very strong gravity of Jupiter caused it to fragment before it even got to Jupiter. And then its fragments hit Jupiter on the far side, and then as Jupiter rotated around, these pictures were taken showing these linear li this line of the sequential fragments hitting the atmosphere of Jupiter. So these large gas bodies act as planetary protectors, pulling these things by their gravity away from Earth so that these things don't hit Earth. Part of the design of the solar system. Well, where do these comets come from? Because if the solar system was old, is as old as they say it is, we should not have any more comets. Because what happens? Every time they go around the sun, more and more of their material is dissipated until they cease to exist. So, in order to maintain the supposed age of the solar system, there must be these comet 
nurseries, according to the assumptions of the evolutionists. So they, they have two of them that they come up with. One of them is called the Kuiper Belt. Uh, here you see the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And then there's the Kuiper Belt. So out there past Pluto, there are lots of these icy bodies, frozen bodies out there. So the Kuiper Belt is real. But what they say is that something happens, and we don't know what the something is, causes one of these bodies to be kicked out of the Kuiper Belt into an orbit around the sun. Whatever that something is that causes this to happen. And if you don't want to believe that one, then you can put your faith in something that they call the Oort Cloud. And both of these names, Kuiper and Oort, were Dutch astronomers, by the way. So this Oort Cloud is this sphere surrounding the solar system that's way, 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 way out there, far away from the solar system, not anywhere near a part of it, that has these objects, these icy objects out there, and something comes along and kicks an object out of this supposed Oort cloud into orbit around the sun. So that's how they try to explain away the fact that there should be no comets in a billions of years old solar system. Well, here's an extremely scientific statement here. Antarctic meteorite holds a tiny speck of stardust that's older than the solar system. Quote, though the grain was way too small for the researchers to date it, they guessed. Based on its composition and the meteorite that it came from, that it's at least four and a half billion years old, around the time our solar system formed. So, like I said earlier, you have to have a great imagination and you have to engage in circular reasoning. You assume it happened and then interpret everything as if it actually happened. Does not fit the scientific method. Galaxy formation and spiral arms. So here we have this beautiful spiral galaxy which would be something like what ours looks like, the Milky Way. But if it were billions of years old, because the center of galaxies rotate faster than the arms out there in the extremity, they would wind up, they would tighten up, and the arms would no longer be distinct. Kind of like, you know, a pinwheel, and it gets all tightened up. So there would be the loss of the distinction of the arms, if these things were indeed so many billions of years old. And yet here we see that there is this gorgeous spiral galaxy that's found way, way far away, 10.7 billion years distance, not time, distance away, because a light year is distance, it is not time. And so they are wondering, the evolutionary uh, scientists are wondering, how in the world can this galaxy be so old because they assume a light year is also a measure of time why is it not a train wreck if it's, you know, if it's that old? Well, because it's not. And then here's a picture of another galaxy that, that's found uh, with unique architecture. How do these things happen? How they're different? Well, they're because they were created differently. And this one was supposedly created when the universe was only 1.4 billion years ago, so that would make it about 12.3 billion years old. Okay, another very rare one called a cosmic ring of fire, 11 billion years ago, shakes up theories about formation of galactic structures and how they evolve. So here's what they think of our own Milky Way and its supposed evolution, They're going through these various stages, and yet they publish this stuff as if it is established fact. That's the killer. So while observing the Andromeda galaxy, this fellow says, this new lunar jet stream telescope is fantastic, love. I could even see the Andromeda galaxy while she's busy being occupied. Earth's position in the Milky Way is an important point because if the Earth were closer to the center of the galaxy, there would be so much light 
we wouldn't be able to see out, and there would be so much radiation, we would be cooked. Also, the Earth needs to be between the arms of the galaxy, again, so there's not so much light that we can't see out and learn about the universe. So we have to be in just that right spot. And so here is showing where Earth is located between the arms of the Milky Way galaxy. Another point here is this business of heavy elements. Uh, according to evolutionary theory of star formation, the stars are only going to be able to make the elements up to number 26, iron. That again, most of the stuff is three quarters hydrogen, quarter helium, and a bit of lithium, and then very tiny bits of other elements. And these other heavier elements are supposed to form by the intense pressure and the intense heat inside these stars. But that, that pressure and heat can only succeed in making up to number 26, iron. So what do we observe? Well, you see here the red lines around the first 26 stopping at iron, but then you see uh, blue lines around number 80, mercury. So when we look at light from these distant stars, they're way out there, they're supposed to be much older, but it, remember it's just distance, not age. They find the fingerprints for mercury in the light from those stars, number 80. It's not supposed to be there. That kind of puts another hole in their theory about how things happen. So again, there's number 80, way beyond what's supposed to be in those stars. So we can see that there's tremendous order in the universe, in the galaxies, in the solar system, on the planet, and in everything in life. So who is this giver of order? Well, in Job, there's this discussion. God is talking with Job. And he says, can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades? Uh, uh, you may or may not know what the Pleiades are this cluster. If you look straight up, we see them. And so there's a photograph of them. Or can you loose the belt of Orion? So here we see Orion, you know, the hunter, the archer. There's the belt there, those three bright uh, points of light. Uh, and then you see the sword hanging down. That's actually a galaxy, M53. Uh, and then here's the representation of the constellation. Or can you guide the great bear with its cubs? So what other cultures and languages call the great bear, we call the Big Dipper. So they extend the drawing to make a bear out of it. And in Latin, it's Ursa Major, Ursa Major, the big bear. In Russian, Bolshoi Medved, the big bear. Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Ordinances referring to laws of the heavens. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, some of these guys are just so smart, it, 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 I, just, I can't grasp it. Not only Einstein, but think even back further to a fellow named Kepler, Johannes Kepler, who used the extremely painstaking observations of Tycho Brahe, a Danish astronomer, who spent night after night very carefully notating. And these guys, all they had was either ink and paper or pencil and paper. That's all they had. They didn't even have slide rules. They didn't have any kind of a computer, calculator, anything. And yet Kepler came up with these laws of motion of planetary objects, saying that, that these actually all are ellipses. Uh, our orbit, Earth's orbit, is not a perfect circle. It's, it's slightly not circular, it's an ellipse. And ellipses, instead, like a circle has just one center point one focus in the center. Ellipses have two foci, two center points, represented by the blue for the sun and the white for the other one. They're, they're both on that line called the major axis there. And so he was able to use this architecture to figure out these laws of, plan, of planetary motion, saying that where, when it's at the part closest to the sun, it will move faster. When it's at the part furthest away from the sun, it will move slower. That was the first law. Then the second law, he said, 
that the, in, in the same amount of time, because of the difference of the speed, at the different distances from the sun, that because it sweeps out a larger area where it's closer, faster, and a slower length, I should say, uh, not area, but length, where it's further away slower, the area of those triangles, basically, except the third side is curved, is the same. Now, how he could figure this out, pencil and paper, I don't get it. Just amazing. Just amazing. And then the third law even blows my mind even more because he talks about then this relationship of the time and the distance along this uh, half of the axis there. And so he's able to figure out that the square of the time is equal to the, cu the cube of this part of this axis. How do you figure the thing out with exponents like that from scratch? I just, I, it, it, it's mind-boggling, absolutely mind-boggling. But he's absolutely correct. These laws are absolutely correct. So further on in Job, do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you set their dominion over the earth? The laws of the heavens. Well, uh, Kepler's figured out some of them. So how we look at things depends upon our presupposition, our assumptions. Do we assume everything based on biblical history or do we assume everything based on secular history the, well not history secular assumptions the evolutionary fairy tale so here's a comparison two worldviews so Carl Sagan and his uh, TV show Cosmos some of you remember this yes and remember how I had the special ability to say the word billions with that big B and he says, who are we? We find that we live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in a galaxy tucked away in some forgotten corner of universe in which there are far more galaxies than people. Humdrum star tucked away in a corner of the universe. So wrong. Johannes Kepler, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Carl Sagan, the cosmos is all there is, all there ever was, and all there ever will be. And of course, with his assumption of alien life out there, E.T. Jason Lyle, an astronomer who's alive today. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, based on Genesis. Johannes Kepler, the astronomer with those laws, went to seminary, started optics, the science of optics, wrote lots about scripture, developed those laws of planetary motion, all these various things he wrote with these Latin titles, because Latin was the language of scholars in those days. Lifelong creationist. Jason Lyle, astronomer, speaker for Answers in Genesis, Institute for Creation Research, now has his own ministry, has written quite a few books, uh, uh, some of which we have here. Um, specialty with solar astrophysics. Uh, here's the titles of some of his books. Lifelong creationist. Carl Sagan, American astronomer, astrochemist, author, pioneered exobiology, that there is life out there, promoted SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which has never been found. World famous guy, his Cosmos series, his uh, uh, tremendous amount of publicity for evolution through that. Lifelong atheist, now a creationist because he left the planet. All right. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by that which has been made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So nobody has an excuse. The witness of nature itself, of creation itself, tells people that there is the God who created us. When I was in Brazil in 1980, 1980 um, I had the great privilege of talking with a missionary couple who had been living for several years with a native group, indigenous group, way up in the headwaters of the Amazon River Basin in western Brazil. 
that people's language was not known by anybody. It was totally unknown. Well, this couple were trained in linguistics, the laws of languages. They didn't learn specific languages, but they, linguistics is a study of the laws of languages uh, from the University of Oklahoma. So they were assigned to this uh, group of people, this tribe. So they lived with them for two years, and all they were doing was learning, ba developing the vocabulary, developing the grammar, developing a dictionary. Did zero preaching, did zero talking about the Lord. And then after two years, uh, they were having pretty good communication with these folks, and one of the young men of uh, that group of people came to them and asked them, what is the name of the man who died for my sins? And they were somewhat astounded, and they were happy to tell him, and, and he explained that he knew from what he saw out in nature that there had to be a creator, there had to be a, the powerful God who created everything, and he wanted to have a relationship with that God, and, and so the Holy Spirit let him know that there was a problem in this relationship because of the sin he had committed in his life, and he wanted to have that right relationship, so he asked forgiveness for the sin for this God whose name he didn't know, and the Holy Spirit let him know that his sin was taken care of for him, and so he came to the missionaries asking, well, what's the guy's name who did this for me? This is not an isolated story. There, there's actually uh, quite a few instances like that throughout the third world uh, where that has happened. Um, so there is no excuse. So when people ask you, well, what about the people out there who have never had the gospel taught to them? Well, your answer is in Romans 1.20. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Futile means leaky bucket. No matter how many times you go back and forth with a leaky bucket, the water never gets there. That's what it means. So it's, it's futile. It's not going to happen. So futile in their thoughts, their foolish hearts were darkened. Now that's what happens. So then, professing to be wise, and I love this because there are so many professors in our universities who think they are wise. Well, they're not. They're smart. They have smarts, intelligence, but there's a big difference between smarts and wisdom. And instead, to become fools, exchanging the truth for, of God for the lie, worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So these folks are lost, and the sad thing is they're influencing so many of our young people to turn away from the God of the Bible. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Right? That, think of what's going on. That's why I hope many of you come back at 2.30. I'll be talking about this kind of stuff, of what's going on today. So even this is this thought that there have got to be planets better than Earth, super habitable planets. That is the thinking of these guys. So they're thinking of not only the evolution from hydrogen to human, but also of evolution of planets to have a better planet than the one we live on, the one that was created specifically for us to inhabit and to have dominion over well, I've given you a lot of information, but I think hopefully a lot of it is just very simple things. Even if you just take away two or three of these simple things, you can use those to talk with folks so that the people that you talk with are not lost in a black hole. No questions. One question. You were talking about the, the faint young son. Yes. Uh, how do those people reply to the maunder minimum? How do they what? How do they reply to the maunder minimum and the maunder maximum? The cycle that the sun goes through. Right. What he's speaking of is the fact that there have been, there, due to the fluctuations of solar activity, like we have these 11-year cycles, for example, and there's longer cycles of uh, temperature difference, such that a thousand years ago, when the Vikings were 
trooping across the Atlantic in their ships and settling Greenland and uh, Vineyard, Vinland, which would be the Canadian East Coast, Labrador, uh, things were much warmer then, much warmer, to the fact that they could name Greenland Greenland because it was so warm that they could grow wheat and other crops there and have self-sustaining colonies at that time. So Greenland wasn't a fib or a lie to promote the real estate at that time. Uh, it, it actually was habitable. And in England at that time, they were able to grow grapes to produce wine, and that's why it was Merry Old with the E, England, because they could make their own wine at that time. But then, uh, especially around 1850, it was much cooler to the point where there was this tremendous problem with a bacterium. It's thought it was a fungus, but actually it was really a bacterium that infected the potato crop. And the, uh, the poor Irish people, under the subjugation of the English lords, were surviving on their potatoes. That's, uh, if without the potatoes, they were in trouble. And indeed, that potato famine happened, and there had to be a mass migration of Irish out of, England, out of Ireland to survive. It was either stay and starve to death or leave. That's why Jonathan Swift, the satirist, wrote um, a very uh, biting uh, piece uh, in which he proposed, tongue-in-cheek, but aiming at the English with barbs, that the Irish babies be boiled and fed to the people to solve the problem of overpopulation. Well, it wasn't overpopulation, it was <laughs> underfeeding. So that was because of the change, much cooler time. So what he's talking about is these fluctuations in temperature. Well, I don't know how the evolutionists want to explain that, except they'll say, well, there's fluctuations in solar activity. I mean, that's pretty much all they can say. So, but the main point is with this faint young sun paradox is with this supposed billion years of age, the strength of radiation from the sun would not be adequate enough to warm the earth to have the water be in liquid form and have life to be able to form at the time when it supposedly formed. All right, thank you. Oh. Yeah. Uh, one more item. Um, over the past years, since uh, 2006, most of the time we have had an active division of AZOSA, Arizona Origin uh, uh, Science Association, here in Cochise County. Uh, but uh, on more than one occasion, the person who was doing the local leadership for us, of, quote, vice president for AZOSA, for Cochise Division, moved out of the county. And then we didn't have someone. So we're looking for someone to reboot. Pastor was the one who took on the task of doing all the publicity for this weekend, uh, for which I'm very thankful. And uh, so we're looking for a couple folks to step up to, to organize the meetings. We provide the speakers. All you need to do is organize the place and the publicity here locally. We, John, where are you? Has, where's John? There you are. Has said he would be happy to be one of two people to be part of a team uh, to share the load. It's not a huge load, but to share the load, you know, just so it doesn't become too much. So we're looking for a second person who's willing to step up also, work together with John, and do the local publicity and arranging a venue so that if this venue is not available, another one would be another church or a public library, that type of thing. Since uh, Azosa is a 501c3, we do qualify for those types of venues. So if you're interested, please, 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 please talk to me um, before you leave. Thank you, Dr. Cecile. <laughs>